Hey everyone, Victor is here, your guide to all things organic chemistry, and today I want to talk about probably one of the most important organic reactions of the 20th century, the Diels Alder reaction. And trust me, that's not just my words. The prominence of the Diels Alder reaction has been recognized by many maestros of organic chemistry, such as Nobel laureates Robert Woodward and Elias Corey. This video is going to be an introduction to this reaction. Here, I'm going to give you the best bare bones information so you can understand what the Diels Alder reaction does, how to approach it on the test or maybe your homework, and what to expect if you wish to dive deeper into the details of this reaction. So grab your cup of coffee, a notebook to work through the examples with me, hit that like button for good luck on the test, and let's get started. The Diels Alder reaction was initially reported by Otto Diels and his doctorate student Kurt Alder in their 1928 paper, and it quickly captured the heart and minds of the organic chemistry community due to its versatility and unmatched ability to create cyclohexenes with a bunch of substituents sitting on them. So what exactly is the deals of the reaction? Well, if I take the diene, let's say like a butadiene over here, and I react it with the uh, some sort of alkene or alkyne, like let's say ethylene and alkene over here, then these two guys are going to react with each other, giving us a new six-membered ring with a double Bond. And of course, when I'm showing the reaction like that, it doesn't really seem like it should be particularly exciting. But if I dress up my molecule with various groups, then all of a sudden I have a very complex product that would be quite challenging to make using conventional synthetic approaches. Just think how many different reactions you would have to come up with to synthesize this monstrosity over here. Now, do you want to know what is the best part of the Diels Alder reaction? It is the mechanism, of course. And do you want to know what is the best part about the mechanism of the Diels Alder reaction? It's that it doesn't matter how you show it, it is still going to be correct. And no, I didn't fall off the mountain head first during my last hike, and I am not delusional. Let me explain what I mean here. Up until this point, we always taught you that a nucleophile, let's say I have some sort of a hypothetical nucleophile, gives electrons to electrophiles. So if I have an electrophile over here of some sort, the electrons are going to go from the nucleophile onto the electrophile. Nucleophile is going to be our source of the electron density, while the electrophile is going to be our electron sink. And therefore, we start our curved arrow from the nucleophile, and we point our curved arrow at the electrophile. Well, that works fine if we have electrophiles and nucleophiles. You see, in the Diels Alder reaction, there are no electrophiles or nucleophiles, yet electrons still need to move around. Well, Kind of. So we still need to show the electron movement uh, with curved arrows somehow. And thus it is irrelevant how we are going to show the electron flow and the direction of that electron flow in the Diels Alder reaction. Let me show that with an example. So on the easiest level, I have a diene like this, and I have some sort of alkene that I'm going to be reacting my diene with. I can show my electrons floating like this, so that overall is going to be counterclockwise direction, I guess, and that going to give me a product like this, or I can take my diene, and I can react the diene with an alkene again, and now I can show my electron flow going in this direction like that, which is going to be clockwise now. And in this case, I am still going to get exactly the same product, same cyclohexene with a double bond at the same position. So it really doesn't matter how you show your curved arrows, it is always going to be correct. How exactly that happens and why the molecular orbitals interact the way they do, uh, that goes beyond the scope of this particular video, so I'm not going to bore you with those details. Now, before we move on to the examples and details, I want to point out a couple of terms that we are going to be using in this topic. And the first term is going to be the diene. This refers to, obviously, the diene. And I'll remind you real quick here that when it comes to a diene molecule, it's a species that contains two carbon-carbon double bonds. There are multiple different types of dienes. For our purposes, we need to make sure that we are dealing with the conjugated diene. And the conjugated diene is 
a type of adenine where our double bonds are adjacent to each other and they are separated by one sigma bond in between them. So something like butadiene, where we have two double bonds separated by a single bond, that works. However, if we have something like an allene, where both double bonds are sitting on the same carbon, or the molecule where the double bonds are separated by sp3 hybridized atoms, like in this case I have an sp3 hybridized atoms over here and there, those types of molecules will not work for us. So the cumulated diene, like an allene, doesn't work, and non-conjugated dienes will not work for us either. The next term that we need to know is dienophile. And the dienophile is the diene lover, and it can be either a double or a triple bond. So in other words, dienophile is whatever we have reacting with our diene. Alright, are we ready to move on? Say yes in the comments below and let's keep on rolling. Now when we know how the reaction works in broad strokes, it is important to keep track of the atoms in the starting materials and in our products. You might think like, duh, it's always important, but hear me out. Let's say I have a starting materials that look like this. I have my diene on the left and my diene file on the right. There are a lot of atoms in those molecules and there are a lot of things that you need to keep track on. And since we are going to be moving our molecules in space and our products will not necessarily resemble the starting materials, it is really easy to lose track of our groups and atoms and where everything is in our molecules to begin with. So here is an easy way how you can track all of your atoms and groups and make sure that they are in the correct positions in the final products. So first thing that I recommend you do, you position your diene on the left in the general C shape, like what I've done over here, and we are going to position our diene file on the right side across from it like that. Now the next thing that we are going to do, we are going to number our atoms. I like to start with my diene and I start with the top atom, naming it atom number one, then we go two, three and four. I don't care about any other atoms in my molecule. I only care about the atoms of the diene itself and as I said, I like to start from the top and go through the molecule. Then, likewise, I'm going to continue with the circular motion and I'm going to number my diene file with numbers five and six like that. Next, I'm going to draw the stem for my product. So I'm going to show the reaction arrow and then for the stem for my product, I'm going to draw a six-membered ring with a double bond on the left side. I will number that one, putting my numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6, like that. So see, I started from the top going counterclockwise and I do the same thing in my product. I start from the top and I go counterclockwise as well. Now I am going to go atom by atom and place my groups where they belong. So on atom number one I do not have anything so there is nothing that I need to put on the atom number one in my product either. Atom number two, which is right over here, we have a CH3 group sitting on this atom number two so what I'm going to do, I will show this CH3 on atom number two and for the clarity's sake I will add those CH3 labels as well. Then on my atom number three over here I do not have anything so on my atom number three in the product I am not going to show anything either. Then on atom number four I have another CH3 group so this CH3 that I'm showing in orange that CH3 has to be on my atom number four so I will show it there like that and then on my atoms five and six I have the nitriles, these cyanide guys. So I'm going to say that I have CN on carbon number 5 and CN on carbon number 6. This method might feel a little bit tedious and time consuming at the beginning, but trust me, that will help you show exactly where your atoms are and not misplace those atoms. I cannot even tell you how many times I see students drawing the product and accidentally misplacing their atoms in the final product, 
eventually losing points on the exam. That is one of the common mistakes that students make, so use the numbering method and eventually you will be able to do it very quickly and efficiently. You won't need to actually write those numbers, but for right now, while you're still learning and developing your skill, please do write the numbers to safeguard yourself from the mistakes and make sure that the groups are in the correct position in your molecule. Now, if on top of everything I needed to show the mechanism for this reaction, then I I would say that the electrons go like this, this and that, or in the opposite direction because as I've mentioned it really doesn't matter how exactly you show that, and in the course of this reaction we make two new bonds, two new sigma bonds, the first one is going to be between atoms 1 and 6, the second one is going to be over here between atoms 4 and 5, and of course we're also going to be making a pi bond between 2 and 3 by shifting our electrons around. Alright, are we ready for some examples? So in my first example I have my diene on the left and I have my diene file on the right. So the first thing that I'm going to do here, I'm going to look at my diene and number my atoms so to make sure that I have my anchor points. It's going to be 1, 2, 3 and 4 like that. I will continue numbering on my Dana file showing number 5 over here and number 6 like that. In the course of this reaction we are going to be making a bond between 1 and 6 and 4 and 5 like that. So if I wanted to show my curved arrows I will do here, here and here like that. Next I'm going to draw the stem for my final product, which is always going to be a six-membered ring with the uh, double bond on the left side for as long as you are following these steps. Next I will number that as well, so I'm going to show my carbons number one, two, three, four, five and six like that. And now I'm going to go atom by atom assigning the groups that I have on those atoms to my final product. So on atom number one I don't have anything except for the hydrogens, so there is nothing there for me to show. On atom number two we have a methyl group, so I'm going to show in there. On atom number three we have a methyl group as well, so I'm going to show it like that. Then nothing on atom number four and on my atom number five, well I have the rest of my day in a file between five and six. I am not going to be breaking that uh, ring, so this part of my molecule is going to stay intact. So I'm going to show that on my carbons five and six I have the rest of my molecule that going to look like that and here I have my product. Now in my next example the diene on the left side has my atoms 1, 2, 3 and 4 like that, but when it comes to my diene file that molecule looks a little bit funny. We have a triple bond over here and remember how I mentioned at the beginning of this video that diene file can be a double or a triple bond. So this one is going to be a perfectly fine diene file, but that means that our carbons 5 and 6 going to end up with a double bond in the final product instead of a single bond. So when I'm going to be drawing my stem, I will show a six-membered ring as such, I'm going to number it, and I will now show the double bond between atoms 2 and 3 and between atoms 5 and 6. So remember, if between 5 and 6 you have a triple bond, in the final product you are going to end up with a double bond. Then going through my atoms one by one, I'm going to show OCH3 on atom number one and atom number four over here, so I'm going to show my OCH3. And then finally I have the esters on carbons five and six, so I will draw them like that. And this is my product. And for my last example, on my diene on the left, I will number my carbons as one, two, three and four like this. Then moving on to my diene file, I have atoms five and 
and 6 like that. So now when I'm drawing this stem for my products, I'm going to show my 6 membered ring, I'm going to number it and add the bond between 2 and 3 right away. And I also see that here in this case, I have this entire part sitting on my diene. So I need to make sure that I show that entire cycle connected between my carbons 2 and 3, which will look something like that. And then on my carbons 5 and 6, I'm going to add my nitriles and here I have my product. And here, just like in the first example, because I only have a double bond between my carbons 5 and 6, I have a single bond between 5 and 6 in the final product. So what do you guys think about the deals all the reaction? Are you eager to learn more? As I've mentioned at the beginning of this video, this is just the introduction to the Diels Alder reaction. I'll go over more details about the reaction requirements, the electronic demand, stereochemistry and molecular orbital interactions in the future videos. So make sure you subscribe to the channel and enable the notification so you don't miss any of those future daily organic chemistry updates. As always, thank you for watching till the very end, watch this video next and I will see you tomorrow.